Okay, so uh, we will start right now at time. Welcome to, uh, to this specific session within the uh, innovation theme. The specific theme of this session is architecture and responsible innovation. <clears throat> As the moderator, it is my privilege to, to not only to moderate this seminar, but also to, to give my opening and closing, closing remarks. The, uh, the seminar will take place as follows. We will have a short introduction, both of this theme and of uh, the panelists. And also, we will have 45 or 40 minutes discussion. And finally, we will have Q&A from you, the audience. If someone during the session really have a question that they think is really important uh, in relation to what is being said by the architects, they're welcome. But no anecdotes and no long explanation, just very clear-cut questions for the architects. It's the architects who are the center of our attention today. And I want to welcome the architects of the panel, which is Carolyn Barat from Ashon Search. It is Philippe Ciamparetti. It is Kengo Kuma from Kengo Kuma and Associates. And it's Jürgen Meyer, who is the principal of J. Meyer H. Architects. And finally, it is Murat Tapanlioglu, who is a founding partner and architect from Tapanlioglu Architects. I will come back with a little more proper introduction, just having said some few opening remarks. Innovation can be described as a new and successful application of an invention which increases performance of almost anything. When applied to architecture, innovation can occur both in its products, like buildings, for instance, and in its processes. Building innovation is not only about incorporating the latest and smartest technologies or materials it could be, but it's also about exploring new processes of design and construction through multidisciplinary practices and experimentation. And we would argue that there is not kind of only one kind of innovation. As you all know, innovation comes from innovara, meaning Italian, into something new. Innovation has different facets and touches many fields, which can be tangible or not. Technology, functionality, spatiality, society, sociality, sustainability, mobility, and competition, of course. I think it's, uh, it's great for MIPIM to put innovation um, on the agenda. We know from OECD that the building sector at large in the OECD countries is actually the sector in the world that has the smallest amount of money poured into innovation, which is actually also part of uh, explaining why some of the building sectors lack uh, attract attraction seen from the market's point of view. So we lack innovation. That is kind of an objective uh, statement from OECD. And I think that by putting it on the agenda today, or this year, by MIPIM, we have to be aware that after years of focusing on the investment side, real estate is now back to basics, you could say. The active management of the physical building is often in the heart of the activity. Lower costs, environmental protection, higher earnings, enhanced user productivity, and comfort. Sustainable real estate and facilities are at the heart of issues facing owners, investors, and end users, and they have an impact both on new projects and existing building, including refurbishment. Investment in innovation means not only putting intelligent technology, as I have stated, in, into the building, but it also is about how can we actually retrofit the many buildings that is part of our huge building stock already. And with these few words, I will just very briefly introduce uh, the panel panelists a little more thoroughly. Uh, I think most of you know who is here, uh, and if not, I have to tell you that work of the architects, here you see the architects, um, work of the architects are run as a backdrop for our discussion. There is no specific order 
to the slides, so they're not ordered by architect or by country uh, or anything else or by category. So just take them as a background, but they're all done by the architects who are here in the panel. Kengo Kuma. Uh, born in 1954 in Yokohama and establishing in 1990 Kengo Kuma and Associates and in 19, uh, sorry, in 2008 you established uh, your European office in Paris. I think uh, Kengo Kuma in many ways do not need any further introduction or it could be a lecture in itself. But um, thank you very much for attending. We are happy that we have you here. Jürgen Meyer is born in 1965 in Stuttgart. Your office, J. Meyer H. Architects, was founded in 1996. Um, and I think it, it, it justifies to say that within the last 10 years, we have really realized or witnessed a company that has boosted its uh, portfolio, its project, where many of the projects are built now and is drawing a lot of attention. Caroline Barra. Uh, was born in 1976, the young ones, it's around the table, in Paris, and established after a long journey around the world uh, in many interesting offices, your own office, uh, Assange Search, is that probably the right word? Right spelling? Assange Search, together with Thomas uh, Dubison, Dubison uh, in 2005. A new player is on the scene, obviously, Buildings are coming up in these very years, and I'm sure that we see here a new company uh, on the international scene as well as the European. Murat Tapanlioglu was born, actually I don't know exactly, perhaps you can tell us yourself <laughs> when you were born, but it doesn't say so in your Sixties. In the sixties, that's, uh, that's a polite way of putting it, that's like me. <laughs> I was born in 60. Um, and in 1990, you also uh, established your own office together with your father, as I understand it, Mr. Hayati uh, Tabanlioglu, in Turkey, uh, which is called Tabanlioglu Architects in Istanbul. And of course, you have, and your office has been part of what I think most people in this uh, room is aware of, been part of uh, creating quality, not only in the built, but also urban fabric of the last 10 years of, amongst other cities, of course, Istanbul. And Philippe Giambaretti, perhaps there was something wrong here? Giambaretta. Camp my Italian is not good enough. Sorry for that. I excuse for that. Born in 1963 in uh, Carcassonne here in France. And Philippe was, well, actually, as I understand, first educated an economist. And then after that, uh, an architect and having worked for more or less a decade together with uh, the Catalan architect Bouffil, uh, you opened your own architect office or team in uh, 2001. The team is called PCA, which stands for Production, Conception, and Architecture. So, no more, no more, no more introduction. We will go directly to the, um, to the questions. And the idea is that instead of you know, pulling this off as a kind of question and answers, we'd rather have a discussion amongst the architects. So, first thing, I think it's, it's important to, to uh, open up the debate about the definition of innovation. I think that for those of you who are already architects or working closely together with architects, I think it's quite obvious that having a panel of pure architects, that architects are on a daily basis working with innovation in the sense that you innovate new buildings, new principles, new ideas, more or less on every project. So I think I would like to have your comments on what is the difference between what you do on a daily basis and more strict innovation within the building industry or within your own practices. And thereby also having your opinion about, or your, your, your ideas about what does uh, innovation mean to you? Caroline, could you be the first? Okay. I think it's important not to fall into the trap of putting too much into a position innovative and traditional. I think the most important thing is to try to keep an open mind. I mean, not to advocate something because it looks new and flashy. For example, you know, at the office, sometimes we really appreciate spending time looking at vernacular architecture or traditional wisdom. Because, you know, like just looking at a special space or program, you can really see how it works the best. But I have to say, I think innovation 
it's also um, the question of, um, I mean, uh, about uh, doing uh, everything you can to be better than the guy sitting next to you, and then try to get results to show you were a success. So it's a question about competition, after all. And that's the way you can attract clients, and I think that's also your, the way you have to be, especially when you're a young firm. So you know that kind of balance between innovative and traditional things. And maybe that's about giving a fresh perspective that can inspire your clients so that together you're going to be everything you can to provide opportunity for growth. So innovation, sorry, innovation uh, also as something very integrated into your practice as actually pushing the border or the bear of, uh, of quality. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah. Uh, Jürgen, would you have a comment? Well, I think, yeah. I think it's not on. Well, certainly mine is on. <laughs> okay, we have one microphone. That's good. Um, it's it's of course a very general question that you're asking, and I think it happens really on all levels. One part I think is important when we talk about how to communicate architecture to a public but also to a media and what comes across when you do that. For example, competitions are a big uh, important um, institution that actually asks for innovative ideas to compete and see how that um, reflects also not only within the jury board but also with the general public or the people who are going to actually live and use these buildings. Um, so if you see how different cities start to have open forums, um, actually not competitions where there's kind of a drop sculpture or like a drop building coming at some point with a surprise, but it's a process that actually can be followed and can be understood as a decision-making process. I think that's a very important part of um, uh, the general quality of architecture in our cities. When we design, we think more of like the sculpture and the atmospheric qualities of a project and not so much in terms of what it will be built of in the beginning. That catches us later on uh, and forces us to be really innovative, um, work with a whole team of engineers, um, of course clients, also our kind of specialties and the companies. And that's when we develop a lot of new kind of construction um, possibilities which were, you know, at the forefront of what can be done, for example, in Seville, the largest timber construction in the world, or like bonding in technology. Your, in your own project. In on our own projects. Yeah. So in, in a way, it, it also, you have to establish a certain network that helps, or like a certain method that helps you to force yourself to be kind of always curious about what are the new potentials. And um, But it's kind of a, a system that you have to try to develop for yourself also. But, but developing it for yourself somehow also make it, makes it very, I wouldn't call it private, but at least it's not, it doesn't become systemic as one would consider the scientific innovation. So do you think that's not possible within architecture? Well, I think if you are successful, then the results that you're creating are becoming prototypes for other okay, architects and other around. buildings. Yep. And, you know, we all talk about sustainability, which of course is important. In the end, I think all the five parameters, which is cultural innovation, social innovation, um, being economical and ecological as well, only work if they become kind of transferable to other, exactly. to other um, yeah. uh, projects. I think, I think exactly that's one of the values that we are changing. Uh, changing how can we create within different companies or within different consortiums or setups, create values and solutions that can actually be used by others. Kengo Kuma, intuitively, your ideas about innovation. I think it's on. Yeah, so for me, is, uh, the innovation and the tradition is, are, are not opposing. Is this it's, uh, people, uh, usually people as uh, think innovation is going this way and the tradition is like here like that but uh, as uh, but I don't think so because as uh, in my case as uh, especially in Japan in 20th century uh, as a tradition as a traditional as a as a method of traditional wisdom was destroyed by the influence of modernism architecture the coming from as a Europe and America international style yeah international yeah. style and yeah. and and that is a kind of style that destroys the diversity of our tradition and the richness of our tradition and then the, what I'm trying to do is mm -hmm. the going going back to tradition but it's not pres as a as a as a 
not a conservative attitude. Retro, no. Yeah. <laughs> I want to get some new hint from tradition. And, and that is the real innovation. It's, it can be beyond the international style. So, so maybe to, to put it very simple, to, to find the kind of the future of the past or find solutions from the past in the future. Yeah, exactly. Mm. I think that's obvious from uh, your work uh, in many ways, one of them being uh, a strong bond or relation to traditional architecture, and then on the, on the other hand, actually have an experience of being in a total modern space. I think we also experience this, what King Kuhn is talking about, when we are talking about uh, developing new sustainable cities, um, Masta and others, I'm sure everybody knows these uh, projects, projects, and to a certain extent they actually draw on uh, capacities and knowledge that is thousand years old or even more. Anyone further? You? Thank you. Um, I think it's what's important that uh, we are at a special age in time where uh, today innovation has become some kind of, uh, you know, on the lips of a any manager or mayor. It's just that there is a big focus on innovation because this the world is changing so rapidly today that it's uh, it becomes a sort of a buzzword for living or dying. I mean, uh, innovating is like an injunction today. And uh, with a special novelty in this beginning of the 21st century that it's very much linked to speed. So there's faster and faster innovation and also hybridation. And I think what's interesting today is that, uh, as you say, innovation is not only a matter of uh, new technology, but it's very wide. I mean, it's, it can be social, it can be uh, environmental, and it's using different um, element, very complex type of input. So it's no more about individual creativity, but uh, co-creativity. And so that's something that the company to do with are very uh, challenged to find how to organize and how to architecture this innovation process. And I'm amazed to see that there have been a lot of publications recently at Harvard or MIT about, you know, architecture of innovation. And because somehow I found that the way, the work we are doing as architect is very daily this kind of co-creation of dealing with very uh, diverse data. And in a way, I think that uh, architecture today can be sort of laboratory for uh, general um, uh, innovation. That's one idea. But, but um, I think most people in this, uh, in this space has the impression that often the architect, uh, when having had a meeting with the architect, the architect has to go back to his office and think. Um, what you're suggesting is that a more open, uh, network organized way of creating solutions, which is not so much about the idea of the one individual being kind of the genius of creativity or? I, I, absolutely, I, um, as far as I'm concerned, I believe very much in that, uh, in that process. I mean, uh, we try in the agency to have a very open, uh, co-creative process of uh, inviting a lot of different intelligence around the project, being other architect or artist or designer, I mean, uh, or sociologist or philosopher, that in project and also on some theoretical research. I think today it's not only, I mean, architecture has this uh, very interesting capacity to integrate all these different questions. It may sound a bit generalist, no, but no, that's no. what makes it so fascinating, I think. <clears throat> Murat, can I ask you, you, are, you have been part born in the 60s, as you say, you have been part of what has happened in the zeros here in Turkey in, spe in, in specific, whereas most of the European countries have been going down in knees or pace at least. Uh, what we have witnessed in Turkey is a rapid uh, growth and, uh, well, obviously visiting Turkey, you can be quite shocked about how the urban fabric is developed uh, with a pace that, well, you have to go back in history to find the same uh, amount of speed. Can you tell us about your point of view of innovation in relation to a situation where there's a lot of money in the system, where there's a lot of clients with a lot of money, pouring money into the system. How does that change, or does it change kind of the, the, kind of the, uh, the rules, the game of innovation? Mm, of course, uh, in sometimes in a good way, in a bad way. So um, if you come to Istanbul in these days, it's totally different than maybe 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, there are places that I don't know before, so they are new developed. Uh, maybe, as you know, we will have the third bridge. Maybe we will take the Olympiads in 2020. That will change the whole world. 
they are making a big tube uh, between Asia and uh, Europe. So that will connect first time Asia and Europe together. So that's a huge change. So, 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 so one could argue yeah. that because I've been visiting Turkey on a regular yeah. basis that, that it looks like a kind of uh, innovation leap that's taking place or is it just a rapid development? I mean, is, is, there, an, is there any positive development taking place as the economy is boosting as it is. I mean, you have been talking yourself, I know, with me, about some of uh, some of the, for instance, touristic uh, uh, challenges. Yeah, Of course, we are not Dubai or Astana. Istanbul is a strong story, and mm. uh, I call Istanbul always a city of contrasts, and that means uh, you can demolish many things, but still you can keep the quality of the city because the topography is nice. Mm. Uh, the only danger is the uh, earthquake. You know, uh, earthquakes change cities a lot uh, in Japan. Uh, remember Lisbon? When you go to Lisbon, you can see the French architecture after the. And we had 1999 the, the let's say the little earthquake and. Um, in last week, I think a Japanese engineer came and said it will be earthquake in the next years. Mm -hmm. So everyone was against him. But all the buildings we are doing now, also without good architects or engineers, are earthquake proof. So mm -hmm. that's a big change, first of all. Is that specific innovation in the sense that you you yeah. also take a, a move up up the ladder in terms of, I mean, you've had earthquakes all, all the time of your history, but now you're, you're moving into another uh, financial, heavy financial investment. You also is demanded to deliver on, on a higher uh, security. Yeah, yeah. Because all, um, I had a project before the earthquake after the earthquake, That's all right. the rules changed, yeah. and then we had to redesign many things. So, so engineering is more and more important, which is good. But all the rules are a little bit against to make good architecture. So that's the problem. So as architects now, we have to come back. I think the other thing very important is um, the politicians. Uh, since 10 years, we have the same system. Uh, we had many problems before that. And now our politicians want to see more tradition. Okay. Um, like Kengo Kuma said, but it can be dangerous uh, because in Turkey we don't have this real postmodernism time. So uh, that's you can have it now. You <laughs> in the sense that you can have that kind of retro uh, symbolic uh, for iconic. Example, I have to design a bank headquarters. Yeah. Um, they are saying me it should be like uh, Sajuki style. So. Uh, we have to discuss this. But can uh, I just, uh, it's just leading to my next question here yeah. because you're saying the architect has to come back. And now obviously the architects are, are well represented in this panel, but, but you could argue that new innovations in general, uh, and I mentioned this with the OECD benchmark uh, in the beginning, uh, that innovations are to a large extent actually done by engineers and industrial designers. Uh, do you think in general that architects are well enough locked in into the value chain of contemporary innovation. Are we close enough to the circles where the decisions are taken? It could be public-private partnerships, it could be pure public uh, innovation research, uh, or are we actually living kind of off the side, uh, not getting engaged enough with the client's problem, with the engineering's ca engineer's capacity, uh, and their focus on uh, risk uh, and, uh, and, and investments, for instance. Are we on the side? Ken Kukuma, what is your exp uh, Im impression of that question? Are architects well enough locked in? Do we create value in innovation um, in respect to other fields? Uh, I think the, uh, the architects can be the node the, which the connect the engineering and the synthesizers as a, and the, and also even the economies as, a, as a, without the uh, as a role of architects as a, those kind of thing cannot create anything it is all separated i think and uh, and as a, as a day by day and year by year the the role of the architects is getting more important than before 
Okay. And is it happening? Yeah, are, are I positive? think there's some, as a, but it is not easy no. to well, what, play what that would be kind the, of role. When you say it's not easy, what is actually the, the barrier? What is the, uh, the a, steep uh, hill? Is, uh, the easiest way is, is to show the successful project yes. to them. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what I'm trying to do is to show is a, is a successful project. Is a, Demonstrate, which, yeah. Is a, it is good for, successful means it's good for the society and it's good for the economy and it's good for the everybody. That is that, uh, that my definition of successful project. Mm -hmm. Caroline, you're, you're part of a younger generation, not to stigmatize you as the young one, but, but still saying that you have been around the world working in many different offices. What is your impression about our ability as architects to be locked into those innovation circles? I think, uh, well, just to go back to the question, I think there's really something that we as architects have that is different from engineer, and that is definitely related to the value chain of uh, contemporary innovation, is first of all, a relationship with our client and a relationship with the design mean. I mean, I think... Sorry, with, with a relationship with... With our design team. Yeah, design Meaning, team, yeah. I think we've got the capacity to challenge our collaborators just to help them think outside the box. The and other the other fields. Yeah, yeah. Well, Engineers. Exactly. And then yeah. we've got that capacity just to communicate with our client and to help them understand how the benefits of doing something new. And in that way, I think we're really the one well, in a way, the leader to have the capacity, the opportunity to into promoting innovation. And is that because architects are more talkative than engineers, or or is no, it because we are we are actually more engaged not, in? Well, because their I think at the end we are really the one where the where the most the best contact with a client, and yeah. we so we are you know just that kind of key not key point with the uh, reaching exactly either with the design team because we are the one who leads the design team, and at the same time the relationship with our client, we are the one with the most direct contact. Exactly. So we are just at the boundary. So so very often what you're describing is actually part of the value chain that very often. Often, you, when you have big competition, especially if they are public, uh, it is the architects who are actually on the top of the value chain because they are leading the design team. Uh, so for that reason, one should argue that it should be possible to, to kind of purvey that quality of architecture into the innovation also when it comes to new, uh, new ideas, new solutions. Yes, but... Um I was also trained as an engineer before, and when I went to architecture, I saw that, I mean, we, we have to remember that uh, architecture also is, is, is a meeting with, between art and science. Exactly. And I mean, that makes a big difference, because we are not in this race for competition where you just have to, you know, push your product faster than the next one, I mean. The, like the, manufacturing industry. Exactly. Yeah. And so the, this artistic dimension, and you know it in, in the art field, that uh, being uh, just innovative doesn't make a good artist. Uh, because it doesn't, it's not just to enter into quick gimmick of, uh, and that, that could be one of the shortfall of trying to be uh, innovative at all price, just to, you know, uh, uh, look only at the aesthetic dimension of uh, architecture, which I r remind is just about also form, function, mm -hmm. and technology, and, the fun and for me the, the function and, and the, the work on the usage, it's maybe less obvious, less spectacular, but in my opinion, this is where we have a lot of work to, to do as an architect, is to think ahead of the way people's behavior and way of life is going to change in the future. Mm. And that's something that, uh, that is uh, less spectacular, but very interesting to, to research. I feel there is something about um, innovation in terms of on what, on what scale of innovation we are talking about. Um, mm. If you look at, for example, electric cars, everybody thought it would happen in the next two or three years. This was a discussion that happened two or three years ago. Mm. Now everything slowed down and the reality is a little bit different now. So the question is, you know, on which levels or how fast certain ideas can become part of an everyday life. Same in buildings, you know, we talk about the building as an energy producer than an, rather than an energy consumer. And this is like, out there for a couple of years now as a discussion, which would solve a lot of um, problems. Um, also problems, aesthetic problems, when for example in Germany, our buildings get thicker and thicker every year because the rules are insulating, Insulation, insulating. Yeah. If there's a different understanding of a kind of a dynamic energy relationship to a building and to what an, uh, the energy in a building means, then you know, aesthetically this will have extreme consequences. But I think that's a very, very, very good and very concrete example of what I'm talking about 
when I'm asking whether we are part of the innovation circles, because many architects, they do that in the Scandinavian countries too, they're complaining about the walls getting fatter and fatter all the time, uh, and this will just uh, be uh, go on for the next decade. So, so why are we not part of that, uh, or you as architects, why are you not part of getting closer to working together, for instance, with the big insulation companies and others of developing the, the houses or the, the, the principle for, for, for the buildings? I think it's more a problem of laws and lobbying, actually. When you look yeah. at Switzerland, um, they had, a, I think, a 2000, what, I don't know, like some kind of rule, like how much energy can be lost or, you know, uh, yeah, through yeah. a building. Um, this was, you know, fixed and made kind of concrete by a very precise lobby group. There are new engineers coming in, and in a way it's true, it comes through engineers rather than from architects um, who try to define a different performance, like a dynamic understanding of energy, which will completely change, but it has to be always fixed into laws or in some kind of regulations. Um, and I think that's something that needs to be discussed because it's not a one-way street. You know, it's actually something that new technology has effects on uh, on the architectural aesthetics in the end, mm -hmm. and therefore on quality of life. Mm -hmm. Murad? Murad, please. Um, I think it's very important which engineer you are working uh, because when you are you make a competition, we make a competition now in Tokyo. I think in, for the Olympia, yeah, and we make the you, finals. You, you make one together? Uh, no, no, no. Oh, okay, uh, at the <laughs> you end, compete against each other. Yes, uh, <laughs> at the end Zaha once, of course. Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we worked, for example, with Hanif Kara from London, AKT. From zero on, uh, we just with emails, sometimes meetings, just one month, and then I can see the quality of engineering uh, to work together. So, then so that changes your architecture. Yeah, yeah and then, uh, but changing, we are designing together. This yeah. is uh, yeah. electricity, okay. this is very yeah. important. Mm -hmm. And if you make a stadium uh, where the engineering is really important, it can kill everything. So you have to work from zero on. That's very important. It's the same with the isolation. Uh, you have to work with the firms together, with the engineers and uh, with all the group together. Uh, so, so you have to influence uh, the industry because otherwise you are in the hand of the industry. So you have to take what they are giving to you. And it will be always cheaper for the client. You know, that's the danger. It, it actually leans quite neatly on to the next question, which is about how you work. I stated in the beginning there's both how you work and then there's what you do uh, of innovation. But uh, obviously the the computerization of architecture or the, the kind of the conditions for how you create your architecture is so much linked into digitalization of any information now. Or is it? I'm asking you because one of the big uh, kind of uh, trends around the globe, I would argue, more or less uh, in the developing countries at least, is kind of user-driven innovation. The fact that the user, uh, through crowdsourcing and others, are getting closer and closer to the production or to the innovation line, so to speak. Having worked for years, and some of you for decades with architecture, um, the change of moving into a kind of pure digital world. What has that meant to you and how do you see that as an opportunity to get even closer to the client and to the end user? Or do you? It's an open question, but it's obviously, obviously just something that's a reality now. But what does it mean to you? Anyone wanna? Well, yeah. you know, Okay, so maybe I'm one of the youngers here, <laughs> but you know, at the same time, we have all we have integrated like all the 3D modeling technology, and we're always ready to expand that dimension of our work. But at the same time, our design process is extremely low tech. I mean, we're doing model, model, like, physical know, models, physical model, and you know, like each project goes through like many versions of those physical model, uh, models. And at the same time, we understood like you know the value of using such kind of tool and to communicate with our client because you know sometimes when you're spending some time with your client, looking at ground floor plan or beautiful 3D imagery. And I mean, I just love doing those beautiful 3D imagery, but I mean, looking at a model. 
it's a way to enable a really transparent communication with your clients, but also with your design team. And I mean, as an example... And, and you would argue that that's even better than, than, than a small cinema going I, into I a 3D know, model with your clients, where the clients can move around where, wherever yes, they I want? Yes, Because, you know, at the same time, you understand the scale, and it's not scary. Meanwhile, I mean, if you're just looking at one of those beautiful perspectives, at the end, it's going to be, the okay, renders. am I really buying that? Yeah. And, you know, as an example, at the office, we're currently working on a competition to redesign the dynamic lighting of the Eiffel Tower. So that's a beautiful <laughs> subject. And I can, like, you yeah. know, like the glittering effect on the um, Eiffel Tower that has been installed on, the year, one, the, the yeah, screen, on yeah. the year 2000 going to be replaced. And so we have to come, over with a, to come up with a solution even better. So it's a really high challenge. Whatever. So we did all the 3D modeling, I mean, um, lighting calculation. We even did a movie. But at the end, we built up like a one and a half meter high cardboard model. And it happened In to your be studio, a, you just built a cardboard model? By our hands, just oh. to understand how the building works and how we're going to be able to put on our light effects within. And that happened to be like a beautiful tune. And I think we came up even with um, something like even much more. So it did make a change to nature. go back in your that's methodology. Once again, you know, the opposition between traditional and innovative, and once again, low tech and high technology and that kind of mixture. But I mean, at the office, we really. We have integrated all those three tools, but we really love using, I mean, doing our project with our hand. King Gokuma, you are building projects and you are teaching around the globe. How depending are you on the new technology when it comes to producing your buildings? Yeah, so basically, I'm very much interested in using the, the local material. This is a natural Building local material. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But the, if I want to realize something from that material, so we should use the high tech. As a computer technology is very necessary, and uh, for the design phase and also construction phase, the computer technology and digitalization is very necessary. Yeah. And then, the, uh, and if the concrete, if we want to use, uh, use concrete and steel, it's not so actually necessary. But for the local material, because it is fragile, it is basically weak, and so we should combine with the very contemporary technology. Mm -hmm. And then the combination, integration, is very necessary. And I, I, I am very much interested in that kind of contrast. The material itself is very the low tech. Tactile, <laughs> physical, yeah. yeah. The meeting, the integration is very necessary. And also for the communication, as, as you mentioned, the, my offices always use the real as a model. Physical models. As a physical model. Old fashioned model. Uh, old old fashioned model. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I only believe the old fashioned model mm -hmm. because the three as uh, 3D uh, the, the drawings is just the 3D drawings. Drawings. But as a real model, as a model is something different that can give the different experience. Let me just try to push you a little further, because uh, looking at that, uh, running architectural or engineering offices in Europe is obviously getting more and more expensive in relation to how we can have something, some of the work done, for instance, in India or Bangladesh or other uh, countries where they have well-educated computer for people who can actually sit there working for a tenth of a, a German or a Danish engineer. So would you be ready? Are you working with along that level of innovation that you are pushing or outsourcing some of your work? For instance, when you do the, the, the tender drawings and others, are you, are you ready to, to, the, to do that or are you already doing it as part of your own kind of business innovation? <laughs> Very silent. <laughs> uh, I don't think. You don't think we, so? No. So I want to do everything in my, under my hand, so it's more secure. So all the way through? Yeah, all yeah. the way through, from mm. beginning to the end. And to control the quality? Yeah, and then I hate all the renderings they are making in my office. So normally, if the client doesn't want... And what if the purveyor, what, what if the, the, the solution provider says, well, the people in Bangladesh, they can actually do it better than your people can do, and they could do it uh, for a tenth of what your people do? That's my problem. <laughs> but the okay. thing is, uh, like Kengo said, um, when you make more in-house models, yeah. it's more more human. So you can show this to the client, and you can make the models bigger and bigger if you cannot understand, you know. No. And this is always you can make it with young people, and they are also in the team. 
yeah. and to 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 make renderings outside or we have to do this sometimes for for uh, people for uh, to to make it uh, in their catalogs and films but always they are dangerous and not nice mm -hmm. uh, i think then your feelings are that i think when it's starting it's this photoshop is a, for example is a very dangerous thing you know it's dangerous <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, but every kid thinks it's like just toy, playing around. A new yeah. educated architect around the globe, they think it's just like candy. So, so they, they work with it. But isn't it a kind of threat to the practices that you're talking about? Wouldn't it push you? No? Uh, all my <laughs> students, uh, they, they in the school, so they, they have to make models. So, yeah. so you force hand. them. Yeah. To, make, yeah. <laughs> to make models. Yeah. 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 So, so more or less what model, I hear yeah. is that you all of you consider that it's becoming more and more necessary, it's actually paramount to have it, to use it, but on the other hand, you will insist on the kind of the traditional classical model. You can, once you, when you did the, uh, the parasol project for Sevilla, it will come up here later, uh, it looks like uh, very simple, very old fashioned in some way, there it is, and then it's just like, you know, old models, toy for kids, and then on the other hand, it's cut in a way where you obviously consider there must have been a computer here. So what is your uh, distinction between the two? Well, actually, when we did the competition, it was a different form of structural solution. We worked with Arab engineers, and I was never really happy with what we presented for the competition, how to build these parasols. Construction-wise. Uh, yeah, construction it was more like a radial steel structure with like an uh, applied-on um, uh, kind of skin or elements that kind of create so you the, the volume. In steel. In steel, yeah. Yep. And I was happy when is, they yeah. said you win it because we like the concept, but go back and rethink the idea of the parasol. So we worked on a couple of concepts and we wanted to actually we made a move from building the skin, the form, to actually building the volume inside. And so by going into that scale, um, I mean, this was 2004, so 10 years ago, more or less, mm -hmm. where computers were not where they are now. Yeah. And actually, something like this on a 10-meter scale would have been easier to calculate. But this is like 30 meters high, 150 meters wide. It's a non-directional um, system. So one calculation took like three weeks for the whole thing. And if you change something somewhere, it takes another three weeks. If you make an error, you know, which happened because the direction of the wood grain was not considered. It's all, it's, made in wood. it's all made in wood. It's all made in wood. We didn't really know how to build it. I mean, we had an idea of what the spatial consequences and the north-south oriented grid was actually pretty helpful because we could be very elastic in adjusting the shape to requirements from the landmark department going higher, going lower, um, making thicker or thinner volumes according to load or dimensions we needed structurally. So this was very helpful. In the end, it actually still was super complicated and it became um, the largest timber construction in the world. It has a polyurethane coating, which is fantastic for weather protection and for uh, maintenance. And it also introduced a bonding technology. It's like glue details. And all of that actually came afterwards, um, you know, by trying to figure out how to make it happen. So super innovative, but with all the networks of engineers, companies, and so forth involved. Okay. Any further? Uh, we, we are kind of moving into wrapping up, but I would like to end up with a question that may be even more open before we go into uh, to, to Q&A from the audience. Um, the kind of, you know, globally, I think we, we have an impression of, of that the idea of modern architecture, which somehow started out in, in, in Europe, uh, had the ambition of contributing to a, a better life for the many. It was kind of a soft socialism in Europe, at some point a tough socialism, but it was really about architects playing an important role in creating value for the broader public. Would you argue for your own sake and for your kind of your colleagues in general globally that that ambition is still an inherent part of of what you do as architects, and of course it could be obvious to say yes, but uh, how do you actually use innovation to accomplish even more? I would argue that there are two major um, things to be considered. One is that we have a, a much higher demand for social integration in our cities, uh, amongst rich, poor, and ethnicities. 
and the other one is that in Europe, if you take Europe, only 1% of what is built already is added every year. So retrofitting is really coming up. And when I look at all the work you do have done, which is wonderful and beautiful and seducing, very little of it is about retrofitting. So what, how, would, how would you consider the architect's future when it comes to really creating value for the broader society? Anyone? Well, maybe I start. I think that, uh, of course, that there has been a lot of uh, downside to the modernism and that uh, we have measured at the end of the 20th century. But today, I think it's, a, it's an interesting moment where uh, I see, for instance, the, the, the position of the Danish architect was the, the sort of a pragmatic utopia, uh, being mm -hmm. a way to uh, being part of what's happening, not against the economy or not mm -hmm. fighting against the system, but trying to be uh, still um, with a utopian attitude mm -hmm. to... There is a moment where we have all together to move to a new a new stadium, a new stage of uh, society. And that's clear, I mean, that's, that's for me in 50 years, it's the first time I feel that there is, with the investor, with the developer, with the, the public people, everybody is asking the same question. So there's, there's kind of it's new, new, uh, new power of, uh, of uh, sticking together on a, an agenda, a kind of holistic agenda, or how would you characterize it? I mean, there's a kind of social implication in what everybody does, or? There is, I mean, then everybody is, um, can have his own agenda, but there is a moment where we all share a question about the future. Which has to do clear. with sustainability, perhaps, primarily? Social, and uh, yeah. clearly the, the sustainability has been the, 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 the driving force for uh, this, mm. this common questioning. But it's creating, I think, uh, I don't know if you feel that, but new form of, uh, uh, mutual respect between the That's the an clients and the mm -hmm. and the architect that that uh, therefore is a new opportunity for us. Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Uh, Kengo, you have your your country have experienced uh, really severe damages within the last years. Um, has that pushed? It looks like from the outside that it has actually pushed the architects a little further into the scene of society. Is that true, or how would you? Uh, so, mm, it's, 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 the current situation of Japan is not so easy for us. No. Because as a, after the as a disaster, as a, as a tsunami and an earthquake, mm, the Japanese government is a, uh, cannot decide anything, basically. <laughs> Paral paralyzed. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, because it's, it's, um, it's, it's, the, the damage is too huge and mm. too, uh, too, uh, very wide. Mm. As, a, as, a, as a case of Kobe earthquake, it happened in 1995. Yes. Mm. It is a big earthquake, but the, still, it's a limited area. Mm. But as a, as a two years ago, the earthquake, it is uh, more than a thousand kilometers. So yeah. It is. As a, then the as a, as a government cannot decide anything, cannot this make the master plan. So as a, already two years passed, but well, almost nothing happened after that. But, then but, the, but I see a lot of Japanese architects have, have kind of then, thrown themselves into the, yes, yes, engaged and, themselves. Yes, and then as a, we Japanese architects as a, this, mm, decided to do ourselves Okay. And then so we, so we so try to get the money from, from the company by ourselves. And, uh, but it's just not a big money, but no. we, uh, tried, uh, we already started to build the, the Mindano Ye project. Mindano Ye yeah. is a small, small community house. Yes. For, uh, yeah. and, and also uh, to suggest new ways of yeah. using the landscape yeah. in relation to the water and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but now I think, I feel, as a, as a, as a weakness of the government is, is is a destiny of the society. Wow. <laughs> For, and then, as a, as a we are architects, should start by ourselves. It's a big lesson from the disaster. And okay. that lesson can be used for, uh, for Of course, person. yes, yes. It's, it looks very inspirational. Um, anyone? 
further? But yeah, you Maybe just a quick comment. It, in Germany, at least, I think concerns mostly buildings from the 60s and 70s. Um, and sometimes it would be cheaper to tear them down and rebuild them. But of course, they become part of our recent history. And so yeah. for cities like Berlin um, or Düsseldorf, you know, they are really part of a collective um, accumulation of architectural languages. Um, heritage, and so it's yeah. important. Cultural heritage, but if yeah. you look at how they perform now, you know, climatically, how they perform for like new technology, computerization, and so mm -hmm. forth, it actually is a big challenge to f upgrade them. That's true. But on the other hand, if you tear them down, there's potential for new buildings too. <laughs> Which architects generally like a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or like you are doing now, the palace is coming more again up. Huh? It's also something dangerous. Yeah. Huh? So I will uh, open up now for a dialogue for questions for anyone in the panel uh, from the audiences. So please consider if you have a question, uh, don't be shy. Just come forward. Um, does anyone have one so far? No, but then we will. Con yes. I wanted to tell you something because me. I yeah, really, let's hear. I, I really appreciate. I mean, instead, someone has a question, but I really appreciate your. I mean, the last question, mm -hmm. because you know, in my point of view, like I really do believe that architect, we can do a lot. I mm -hmm. mean, according to your question, and I do remember just when we opened the office, we won that incredible competition that was to build like a water sports center in the suburb of the Valfouré housing project close yeah. back Mont La Jolie. I don't know if you heard about that district, but you know it's one of these districts that is very often cited to show the urban social malaise yeah. in the Paris, in the suburb of Paris. Mm -hmm. And pretty often you see like one of those French presidential candidates going there and showing they're really in touch with urban violence and they're going to do everything <laughs> they can to make it work. Yeah. Anyway, the region hire us because they want in the project that can have the ability, the capacity of changing the neighborhood and also to bring some people, to attract people Ch outside this neighborhood. So changing the sociability Absolutely. Of, of the neighborhood. Yeah. And actually, we did a project that is big and beautiful and doesn't like, but the key to its success is that it really, really enabled people to enjoy their own district. Mm -hmm. And you know, like until the very opening day, we didn't realize that the target of the audience was like 8 to 15 years old. And today, every day, I mean, the, uh, the pool is packed with kids. And I know like there's so much that needs to be done and so much that needs to change, especially in those districts. But what has been really fulfilling for us is to enable people to enjoy their own neighborhood. So in that way, I mean, I think we really can. I mean, in a way, we've got that power. And it's it's also about uh, what I hear is also about the empowering of people, of a neighborhood by the mean of, uh, of design, of architecture, exactly. which, which then uh, kind, of, uh, uh, kind of pours out into a broader society. I, I, I could see that in your project in Sevilla that it has been, uh, it has heavily been, it been, been debated heavily within your colleagues about its expressive character, uh, also about its uh, kind of uh, innovative construction uh, principles, uh, and people are discussing whether you did the right things, but one thing that is one thing that is not really discussed because it's so obviously a success is exactly what you're talking about here. Also, that much to the surprise of some of your colleagues, it's uh, it's really a huge uh, kind of social condensator. It creates a lot of value. Can you say a little more about how how that uh, how was it to kind of install such a let me allow myself to call it a strange uh, figure or design in this kind of traditional um, city? Well, for us, um, there were a couple of references in the city of Seville, so I don't feel it so strange, but it was no. important how to communicate the strangeness or the familiarity to the people. So, so when and you say familiar, just for the audience, you mean yes. the Baroque or the Rococo? Or well, I'm, uh, I'm giving an example. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think this was also part of the innovative part, how to communicate architecture. The competition was actually in the second phase, an open competition where we had to explain our projects to the general public. Mm -hmm. And there was a board and people could discuss it already, like in the second phase. Um, the references were, for example, huge trees on the neighboring plazas, which are spatially quite similar to what we did as a build version. Um, when you go to the cathedral, they have this beautiful undulated stone roof. So we also made a reference um, to that, yeah. uh, saying okay. it's kind of a democratic urban 
open cathedral rather than a closed okay, institutional yeah. cathedral. And also when you go inside the Gothic structure, you know, the, the structure becomes the space defining element also in our project. And um, I think that's what people understood. Um, there was, from the very beginning, great enthusiasm. Um, there was, of course, doubt mostly with the conservative Catholic people, because the city of Seville in the center has all these Catholic processions around Easter. Um, well, last year they put our project with a Christ sculpture onto the cover of their leaflet, so it means it already accepted also, uh, got accepted with the, 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 the Catholic processions. And um, this is the fantastic part, that mm -hmm. all the doubts that were there in the beginning completely like turned around and now um, create a different form of appropriation from hip-hop videos to movie gangsters to um, you know all kinds of concerts, public viewing, gay pride, um, fairs on the Christmas parties, all of that. Okay. So it's that's the touching part of it. It really arrived. That's interesting. Uh, Murad, you have, uh, you, you've been telling me just an hour ago about how the pressure of Istanbul's kind of top five uh, tourist attractions has been kind of so heavily loaded that it's almost threatening, uh, you know, both the experience of getting to the city as a tourist, but also the specific buildings. Could you just... Uh, very briefly elaborate on how you've been working on on uh, kind of spreading that out in the city as as part of an urban innovation yeah. um, because we have our practice in Istanbul it was with many new projects in the last 10 years and one of the one was the Istanbul modern that was the first mm. contemporary art museum um, we made first a master plan uh, called Galata Port for this area. It's uh, where the cruisers are coming. Mm. And then it didn't happen, this master plan. And so it was a big tender. Uh, many people uh, with um, billions of dollars to, to make it. But it was only one baby coming out from the master plan. That was the only non -com not commercial place was the uh, Contemporary Art Museum. So mm. we turned the entrepot. And when a tourist coming now to Istanbul, he's going to Topkapi and all the other, and coming also to Istanbul Modern, which is, I think, very important. Uh, you can see first time uh, Turkish uh, art, contemporary art, and, mm -hmm. and first time it's a museum that you have a restaurant looking to Topkapi Palace, or you have a, a library, so you, you can uh, stay longer, children has a place, and, and, it's and a that, good relation, you know? and that combined with some other old factories that you fought for to be to be uh, saved instead yeah. of just being uh, yeah. And then um, um, also in the same Golden Horn, mm -hmm. I think Jürgen was there. We we made something without drawings. Another uh, building. Uh, it's an old uh, factory for yarn, and uh, it belongs to my friend. And then we work together, and now there are many events. Audi made an event, for example. Also, uh, arts uh, is coming there. So, I think that it's important to to have all these old buildings. Mm -hmm. Of course, when they have good quality, transform mm -hmm. them a little bit, not too much. Uh, give them good uh, uh, powers, and you know, and then you can use them. If you mm -hmm. start to, to to take them all out from the city, then. There's nothing in more, you know. It's, it's no, very obviously, important. Obviously, there's huge potential in, in the old structures if if you can develop them in such a way that they are kind of investment-wise, financially yeah. uh, <coughs> viable. Uh, um, that's the important. biggest thing was, for example, mm, because I'm the second generation in the office, mm -hmm. my father made in the 60s the Opera House of Istanbul. So it was uh, 1979, uh, then it was finished one year after it burned down. So he made it again. And then uh, the new government first, they wanted to knock it down, but then they decided it was a very political, very good uh, decision from them to, 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 to renovate it. And now we are renovating the building. Uh, it's very difficult to renovate a building from the 60s, of course. Uh, you have structural isolation problems. Yeah. But uh, the building has, uh, it's, it's a memory. It's not only it's architecture. Worse. So no. many people meet in front of the building, in the building, and mm -hmm. mem memories. It's very important, you know. So, so from having started out in discussions about, uh, about kind of the, the core value and quality of innovation we, within architecture and how you work, <coughs> we've been talking about also about uh, how you 
use the new technologies as a condition for how you create your work. And uh, perhaps a little to my surprise, you you all insist on the kind of the old-fashioned model. <laughs> uh, it, it may be just be because, as you say, it has such a strong communicative quality to, to the broader public and to clients. Um, none of you are really that uh, keen on uh, outsourcing a lot of the work. Uh, I would be a little... Um, afraid if I were you on that one in the long run. Uh, also in order to create a kind of a continuous development, innovation and and uh, artistic quality, I think it will be very important that you as architects are able to, to stick to that competency and then perhaps leave it to someone else who is cheaper for, for doing kind of the, the mass work. But um, but that's an open discussion. I, d I think we got quite a clear uh, answer from, from your side on that. And ending up on, uh, on kind of the quality and the value for society with working uh, also on a kind of urban innovative uh, thinking. I thank you very much, uh, all of you, for coming here today. It was uh, great to hear your, uh, your, about your endeavors and your achievements. Thank you so much for your engagement, and thank you also uh, for your attention as an audience. Thank you.